Hi everyone, uh, welcome to Kembali 2020, a Rebuild Bali Festival, a digital program designed to inspire, excite, reconnect, and revitalize the Balinese and Indonesian community from the 29th of October uh, to 8th of November 2020. Kembali, the Indonesian word for return or come back, represents the revital revitalization in the face of global challenges. The festival will unite people in Bali and Indonesia together with an international audiences at a time when travel is largely impossible and creating connection is more important than ever before. So my name is Ripo Saulus and today I'm going to host you about the, uh, with this online event called the future of fashion, right? And Today we're going to have a sustainable activist and also a former fashion features director for uh, of Folk India for 13 years. Can you imagine that? So without further ado, I would like to you people to welcome Miss Bandana Tawari. Bandana. Thank you Hello. for having me. Thank you for having me. Yambala yeah, yeah. 2020 in Rivo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In this interview, I'm looking forward to it very much. Nice, nice. So, how's how's there in Changu? <laughs> Changu is busier than I <laughs> tell you that. Pretty much so. <laughs> and yeah, and I'm sort of in the center of Echo Beach, so there is a bit of activity. Surfers, right. and, you know, the cafes are open. So yeah, it feels a little <laughs> bit alive. Looking great. So, bandana. As we know that you, you're like a, from a fashion features director of Vogue India for 13 years. I mean, like all the way to the island of Bali, Indonesia. What triggers you to restart your journey? Well, it was a big move for me. Can you imagine when you live in a city like Bombay with 22 million people and then you come to Ubud with three suitcases <laughs> and you've pretty much checked out your entire life. Uh, it was a massive move, but something that I needed to do personally. I had the best time with Vogue India, 13 years of high fashion. I mean, high rolling life. You can well imagine, put all the stereotypes there, Devil Wears Prada kind of lifestyle. It was all there. <laughs> and I had a lot of fun being at the forefront, of being able to interview the top creative minds in the world and being having this one-on-one -on -one time with amazing amazing designers and so yep. it was absolutely fantastic but I started going towards sustainable fashion because I was reading so much about the kind of env environmental damage that we were doing with yep. our excessiveness of buying too much and the more you read about it it's very difficult to then go and be uh, in a in a platform that is constantly feeding you the agenda of consumerism that harms the environment. Right. And so moving to Bali was actually, I worked with Vogue from Bali for two years, but ah. when you come here and you're surrounded by nature and you see how it cannot thrive without the ecosystem, um, it was a very easy move for me to resign and pursue my life as a sustainability activist. I think if I hadn't come to Bali, I wouldn't have forged uh, these ideas of where I wanted to go in my professional journey. So I owe my move professionally and personally to Bali very much. Wow, that is that is quite impressive. Starting from three suit two, three set cases, and then you still even work for Folk India for two years in Bali. That is looking good. Anyway, so. I have read that you are inspired from um, Gandhi. So, Bandana, how Gandhi ideology inspires you to promote sustainability, especially in the fashion industry? Right. Uh, you know, Gandhi, as we all know, was a political activist, environmentalist, um, journalist, and lawyer. And yeah. he played a pivotal role in getting independence for India from British colonization. And in the many, many years that he worked towards this aim, this goal to get India's freedom, he followed a lot of principles that we now call Gandhian principles. And when I dive into it, I know that he used it for socio-political movement, but it can apply to everything that we do in our lives and including sustainability. And one of them is Ahimsa. 
which means nonviolence, nonviolence in thoughts, deeds, and actions. So it's such a basic fundamental truth. If we are nonviolent towards people and our environment, then you are a sustainable human being and you are going to be an environmental uh, sustainability activist in your own personal right. And so I like to carry forward notions of this kind in the luxury business because COVID especially has shown us that it was a very, very flawed system um, where it was very unequal between the manufacturing countries such yeah. as Vietnam, Bangladesh, Indonesia, which is such a yeah. big uh, manufacturing hub, India, and then the, the Western countries that all these clothes are fed into almost 80% of the clothes that are ma made for America, for instance, is made from our part of the world. And then when you see how the factory workers are treated, uh, what kind of living wages are given to them, what kind of health benefits are given to them, you know, when big companies, big fast fashion companies, especially are profiting, you know, on the backs and the blood and sweat of people from our part of the world, it became very clear it's an unequal system. And so talking about nonviolence, talking about sarvodaya, which is another term, which is welfare for all. You cannot leave people behind in this profit-making industry that it only caters to the very rich or it only benefits a few, not the many. And these were all principles that Gandhi followed in his sociopolitical movement and changed hearts and minds of people. So, and nonviolence is such a big um, movement in India. It was a very nonviolent movement. There wasn't any war when, you know, you got freedom from British colonization. It happened through nonviolent uh, means, civil disobedience, which we see in <clears throat> protests all over the world right now. Yeah. You know, people sitting out, people refusing uh, to comply with certain laws, but they're not fighting. You know, the right. protesters on the street were saying, arrest me as an act of civil disobedience. I will go to prison because I need to stand up for the, the rights of others. And so I find it very applicable Mm -hmm. that Gandhi is um, principles are, are very relevant today. And if you look at the history of some of the biggest fashion protests that have taken place, um, Extinction Rebellion is one of them. One of the founders says the influence came from Gandhi. So I revisit older notions that existed 150 years ago with Gandhi and apply them in the fashion industry. Wow. That is the thing, I mean, like started from a concept of Ahimsa into a very wide range of, of, of you know, I mean, like it's, it's, it's pretty impressive. And I just, I just learned that, See, so thank you. Right, so Bandana, um, I mean, regarding the COVID-19 period, I mean, like fashion, as we know that fashion industry is pivoting a lot, right? So from traditional fashion show to fashion film, digital fashion week, and you know any other methods for designers to showcase <laughs> their creation, right? So what I would like to know your point of view about the future of fashion, like during and after this pandemic, Bandana. Right, I mean, there's so many things that are going to change. And we, right. can, start off, we can just start off with how fashion was presented, right? So right. I'm, I remember when I was working in high fashion, I literally was in a different country almost every month because there are that many fashion shows. So you have spring, summer, then you have autumn, winter, then you have cruise collection, then you have a collaboration. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, there were designers who were doing 14, 16 collections in a year and that is complete burnout. Not to talk about how much travel was involved and no one talked about carbon footprint of travel at that time, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the amount of expense that goes into having big shows, especially when you're talking about legacy brands like the Chanel's and the Gucci's, there's a lot of money and thought and creativity that goes into it, no doubt. But there was a too much happening. And now with COVID, I think people have realized that, of course, we can't meet. Of course, there's social distancing. But did we really need to go all out in the way that we did in the past to present fashion? So moving forward, I see how ingenuity is uh, going to work for our benefit, like the creativity of people who are doing stuff online. Um, 
what's very interesting is now virtual reality, AI, they're playing a big role in the way fashion is being presented. And so I think in the future, there will be, when we go back to leading normal lives, uh, we will go back to fashion shows, but I think they'll be smaller, they'll be more intimate. I almost imagine probably be like what was, uh, how it started out <laughs> in the first place, like salon-like shows, you know? Right. Where, uh, where there are limited people, but more democratic because you can also have access to it online. Um, I think there are not going to be that many fashion shows to begin with. There cannot oh. be because the supply chain, as we know, has just shut down right now, right? So we are not living in a world where globalization had played such a big role that you could wear a shirt where, you know, your <laughs> buttons come from China, your cotton comes from Bangladesh, the embroidery is done in India, and it can be shipped to you anywhere. I think that level of globalized network has been disrupted during COVID. So in my opinion, and I hope we look to our own backyard for resources, we start buying more local as opposed to being so global. But you know what? I'm one of these idealists. For all you know, there's going to be revenge shopping once COVID is over and there'll be you know, excessive buying all over again. But I hope it isn't because I think we need to correct the system. And so, yeah, I see so much in January. Like when you go, uh, go online, people creative ways of storytelling now about Exactly. Life, right? Yep. You see yep. it. The narrative <laughs> has changed completely. And what is most important, I think, is that and I talk about this a lot. For the longest time, we as consumers, and I'm a fashion journalist, and I was right. very much part of the game that presented fashion as just being on the model, on the ramp. We mm -hmm. never talked about the making of. We never talked about what's the backstory. You know, who are the other people involved in this process? Because it's not just the designer, clearly. Exactly. And so now I see a lot of designers showing you how they make it, why they make it, who's making them. You know, right. so if they're using artisanal skills, they will take you to the culture where they've taken the skills from. Uh, and they, I find that to be a step forward because there are more people involved in this industry than we know, and they should not be invisible. Right. Okay. So regarding to like the artisanal process, and as we know that many high fashion designers and locally as you know, like Oscar Lawalata and internationally like Missoni, Berber Prosim, like Rice Van Noten, et cetera, like source their materials from ethnic countries in India, even like Southeast Asia, like Indonesia, Bangladesh, Thailand, Cambodia. And, you know, during this pandemic, I wonder that production is surely is getting slow, right? So what is your point of view on this and how these designers can maintain the crafters business prosperity? Well, you know, some of the, the people who've been most hurt by COVID are yeah. artisans. Right? Exactly. And because they, if, even if they were working in cities, uh, they had to go back to their homes. Um, yeah. The connectivity has been lost because the production systems have come to a halt. So I think while big international designers should and are quite good at, at taking from different cultures, Dior just did a collection a um, couple of weeks back, which uses lots of uh, Balinese ikats. And that, yeah, right. And I need to sort of deep dive into it. I want to see how much credit they give the Balinese uh, ikat artisans because Good they point. Are, yeah. it should be seen as co-creators. If you're yes. using fabrics that are handmade here, then are they being called out as co-creators? Mm -hmm. Or are they are just silent about the association that they have with cultures? So big brands need to talk about artisans and where they use this cultural um, motifs from, because yeah. that is what's going to encourage local designers to reevaluate their own artisanal skills and use them. So, you know, I've lived in India and it's abundant in um, handmade textiles and embroideries very much like Indonesia. Right. And so I always encourage um, younger designers to now, this is a great time to dip into your own resource pool from your own culture so you can keep the artisanal skills alive. I think 
those days when we all wanted to look very similar, no matter where you are, whether you're in Jakarta or you're in Tokyo or Bombay, <laughs> or Copenhagen, everyone's wearing jeans, everyone's got a hoodie, everyone's got the t-shirt that you can buy anywhere in the world, right? Yeah. And I think now cultural value is very, very important that we look, we deep dive into our own cultures and see what's going to inspire us and engage people who are creating in our community, in our neighborhoods, in our villages. So designers need to really rethink their own creative strategies. Right. And while we can't, we shouldn't rely just on all the big brands. We, each country has their own indigenous designers, right? Exactly. I think yeah. we have a great responsibility to engage the skills from the villages and the artisanal villages of their own country. That's yeah. how you can keep it alive. Right. So, so what can I get from here is like, is, is, I personally think like it's pretty important to you know give credits to the crafters so it will indirectly like lifting mm. up there you know to make it more sellable and stuff yes okay oh, absolutely, absolutely. So, yeah in fact i'm part of um a wonderful organization started by a woman called monica and mm -hmm. uh in europe and it's called cultural intellectual property rights. So we all know oh. about intellectual property rights, but mm -hmm. no one talks about cultural intellectual property rights. Property right. Because when you're diving into someone's culture, if yeah. I came to Indonesia and I made yeah. a collection out of your beautiful batiks and I gave no credit to the batik artisans, if I mm -hmm. didn't compensate them for their work properly, if yeah. I didn't get the consent, then I'm culturally appropriating the Indonesian culture, ah, I right? Understand. So we believe yeah. in the three C's. The three C's is consent. First, you consent. take permission. Yeah. Compensation, you pay the right amount. So there has to be right compensation. Yeah. And then credit. Then you credit. give credit. So if those three things are not met, then it is cultural appropriation. Ah, got it. So the consent, compensation, and the credits. Got it. So, yes. All right. Moving on to the next question. The next, yeah, the next question, Bandana. So, like, you know, in short, the fashion world pushes us, pushes us to change our clothes in every six months. I mean, like, what can we do as a consumer and what can fashion houses do in order to become more sustainable? I mean, I mean, like, it's like an open secret that a couple of there, there are fashion houses burn their unsold clothes. I mean, like, you know, what a waste, right? So what do you think, Bandana? This is such a multifold problem, right? Mm. On the one hand, the big legacy brands, which are the designers, basically, big exactly. designers, they, they do burn their clothes. Millions and millions of dollars worth of clothes because they don't want to put their high-end luxury goods in a discounted store, right? Ouch, ouch. Which, what, which goes to show, why are you creating that much anyway? What is wrong in your merchandising and your inventory that you have to create in so much excess that you burn valuable clothes? On the other hand, your fast fashion companies, by the way, that's not even waiting for the six month cycle. Right. You know, fast fashion brands, you go and see the shop windows, they change every week. Oh. So oh. it's feeding a system of faster and faster, not fewer. So as consumers, what we do is because we are sold to the idea that trends define us, we keep changing our clothes, that you have to have the polka de dotted dress, that you have to have the blue dress because blue is the new black. And all. that is wow. fed into our system so efficiently that we as consumers go and buy and buy and buy. And even with fast fashion companies, the inventory is huge. They go into landfills when they're not sold. They go into secondhand markets, which by the way, ruins the local markets, right? right. Um, so as consumers, what we can do is number one, just buy less. Buy things wow. of value so that you keep your clothes longer. I think when you buy something of value, it's not only because you'll keep things for longer, it also perhaps means that people are getting paid the right wages along the way, whoever is touching the garment, right? And this is as a consumer, as a personal responsibility, you can do that. We've, we cannot live in a world where we say cheaper is better and keep buying t-shirts 
over and over again that costs just a couple of dollars yeah. and <laughs> cheap is good because that someone is paying for it. It may not be me and you, but someone sitting in a factory in Bangladesh is certainly paying for the cheap clothes that we buy. So it's not that you shouldn't buy, but we should demand better from the brands that we buy from. Now we've got our smartphones in our hands. You can check what you're buying into. A lot of the brands are holding themselves accountable so you can actually log on or you can screenshot, you can go to the QR code and you can see, okay, what kind of policies do they have? Do they degrade the environment, degrade people who work for them? Or do they have um, a sense of responsibility and transparency towards their business practices? And we have the smartphone in our hands yeah. to do a little bit of research. Your money is valuable, especially now, COVID times. Sure. Everybody's concerned about how to spend money. So please buy things that you will, first of all, keep with you and not discard after a couple of uses uh -huh. because when you discard your clothes it goes into a landfill or it's right. burnt and we know for a fact from ellen MacArthur foundation that yep. every second every second a garbage truck of clothes is burnt or goes into a landfill that is every second that wow. means the amount of, uh, you know environmental damage we are doing and a lot of these clothes are made out of oil-based products the petroleum yep. the polyester for instance that takes more than 500 years to de decompose how can we be so ruthless to the very environment that nourishes us? So then you go back to ahimsa, nonviolence, nonviolence in thoughts, ah. deeds, and actions. So in thoughts, deeds, and actions. So you can apply ahimsa to your consumer habit. Be nonviolent because whatever you purchase, when you throw away, there is no away in throwing. Yeah. It has to go somewhere, right? Ah. <laughs> Where is the away? It goes somewhere. And it goes into our beautiful lands and it harms the waterways, it harms our oceans. So we need to take personal responsibility as consumers and buy less. But I also feel like this is such an amazing time to support local businesses, cultural, creative businesses. So please look into your own cities, villages, communities and see if you can buy locally and support artisanal crafts. I think it's a great time for everyone to resurrect the ikats and the batiks <laughs> and the beautiful fabrics that are made by hand and, and participate in what is a hand worker uh, economy, made by hand economy. And we are lucky because in Asia, we have an abundance of it, right? So it's right, exactly. It. So what you buy has to have value because you don't want to throw it away. That for me is crucial. That's the beginning of a journey as a conscious consumer. Conscious consumer. So if I can make a conclusion, I mean, like it's it could start from a mindset, you know, I mean, like we have to, not only we buy the things, but we have to buy the value. I mean, I like appreciate the value of the clothes as well, right? So, Absolutely. yeah. So, uh, Bandana, so does that mean that there is a possibility in the future that a collection can be a seasonless or, I mean, like, transseasonal? What do you think? Like, as you say that in the, in the you say that, like, in fast fashion, is it like a week? I mean, collection can change a week. So, you know, what do you think? Oh, it's already happening, which is a great sign. Ooh. <laughs> but, um, yeah, that, because look, climate change, climate crisis, has also made us, uh, reminded us that your summer is not really like summer anymore and your winter is not like your winter. <laughs> now your months are shifting around, your summer comes earlier, your winter lasts shorter. People travel all over the world, traveling all over the world. So if it was too hot, they would go to a cold place. So what is seasonal fashion? You know, <laughs> why have we been sold into the idea that we have to buy new things all the time? People... Yeah. We get conned into the system because it's only because of COVID that we are questioning why do we need seasonality. Forget seasonality, even on a daily basis. As a woman, I know this. We are expected to change our clothes several times a day, pre-COVID. If you went to work, you had to wear work clothes. If you went to school, you had to look like a mother and you wore the, you know, pair of <laughs> Then if you went to a cocktail party, you wore your cocktail clothes. If you went to a sit-down dinner after that, then you had another set of clothes. It's mm -hmm. as if people, are, especially women, are five different characters in one day. 
And what does that do? It fuels us to buy more that because it has to satisfy all these different stereotypes that have been built into the system about yeah. what it is to be a woman. Why is it not possible for me to wear the same stuff that I go to work and I go to party? Why? Who decided that? So we don't even have to talk about seasonless. I talk about like <laughs> on a daily basis. But I feel it's a really good sign that some of the top designers are you know, thinking about it really doesn't make sense to have seasonless, a season-led fashion because people are not wearing the clothes the way they think that they are. You know, we layer our stuff. I can have um, a singlet, but if it's cold, I'll wear a jacket, right? I can mix and match. Mm -hmm. I don't think the old systems work anymore. So it's, it was so rigid. It was so rigid. Yes. COVID reminded us we can sit at home in one garment, do our work online, right. be, comfortable, be comfortable and stylish and work in my kitchen and attend to my friends, but I don't have to change five times. So I think that mindset will mm -hmm. change, I hope, because it, it, I thought it was really dysfunctional. <laughs> the <way this laughs> going. Right. Especially, I mean, like, since we are in Bali, I mean, like, everything can be done in a single t-shirt and a lousy pants. What do you think? <laughs> you know, I love all these little capsule collections that have come out during COVID. Uh -huh. you know, I'm wearing um, uh, this beautiful handmade uh, Indonesian brand called Namu. And they call it, I love the yeah. name, they call, they call Dejamas. They the jammers, the day jammers. And you know, ah. it's very stylish. It's very stylish <laughs> because I can wear it through the day. Yeah. And, and the collection comes, and there are lots of collections, you know, that came out. There's one beautiful brand called Major Minor. Uh, they mm -hmm. did a collection from Jakarta. Right. And these made during COVID times as, and what a realization that we can look stylish and comfortable at the same time. So, and we, I'm, I'm doing a lot of <laughs> webinars and podcasts and, yeah. and Zoom calls like I'm doing with you. And, yep. uh, and it's lovely to feel comfortable and look good. Only the best thing is that I don't have to wear heels. Usually if it was offline, <laughs> and age, and I'd, yeah. be, I'd be desperately uncomfortable in heels, but you know, that's the look. Oh. I just <laughs> and now that I'm not coerced into that, which I really, really appreciate. Got yeah. it. Hundred <laughs> percent. All right. So, Bandana, now I would like to talk about the education. I mean, you know, the fashion education to be exact. I mean, as we know, there are many fashion schools. I mean, like we can see like from short course to bachelor's degree, even master's degree, you know, I mean, like what do you think we can upgrade from the current fashion education like nowadays, Bandana? Yeah, education is a major, you know, uh, area of problem in, uh, in fashion because mm -hmm. who is teaching you the fashion? For instance, we are uh -huh. learning about Western fashion as a student, even though my culture would be completely different from a Scandinavian country and their designs. So if I'm learning about fashion now, I'm learning a lot about Western fashion. I know right. everything about the little black dress by Chanel, I know about the Yves Saint, Laurent, Yves Saint Laurent jacket. I know, but you know, culturally it's very different. If you're in Indonesia and you're in India, you're in Cambodia, we yep. don't, we are not taught fashion that is from our own country. Fashion is taught because it comes from Paris. It comes from Milan, it mm -hmm. comes from New York. So I feel what happens is then the entire fashion system of education is skewed towards the Western eye. It's not the Eastern eye. And that needs to change because we, as we, we should be culturally proud to understand what's the legacy and provenance of our own fashion in our own countries. And we should be learning about that, which doesn't happen. All the big fashion schools are in countries outside Indonesia mm. and Asia, all of Asia, right? Everyone talks about going to England to study fashion or to yep. Europe to study fashion. So what happens is the students don't get to learn about other cultures and their ah. 
So if I went and studied in, in London, if I was a student, I wonder how much of my own cultural fashion would I be taught? Not much. Ah. And I find that to be a massive gaping hole in the education system. Oh, wow. So I think like, you know, that would be great if in the, if in the fashion education system to understand, to understand your own roots first before you learn like the Western, like the Asian and the stuff like that. Would that, would that, would that, yeah, right? of course. And, and that's yeah. one of the reasons if, for instance, every mm-hmm. Indonesian fashion designer, yes, uh, really deep dived and studied into the traditions of the ikat fabrics from different regions in Indonesia, the party techniques or whatever, perhaps they will be engaged to use the artisanal skills. Right? Ah. If we're constantly taught that you can only make amazing Western looking clothes in jerseys and polyester and what have you, if that's what you're being taught, then that's what you will make. Yeah. Um, so I think your creative uh, destiny for a designer, you know, is beholden to what you are s- studying about your own cultural problems first. Got it. Okay. So. Moving forward to that, so do you have like, you know, there are a lot of emerging fashion designers now. So do you have any advices for those fresh graduates? I mean, like emerging designers or people who does the, who are new to the business. I mean, like who are approaching sustainability in their brand. I mean, like in their design, what do you, what mm. is your point of view? What can you advise? Oh, I feel really optimistic about emerging mm-hmm. designers because I think the emerging designers know that if they don't have a sustainability plan in yeah. their business, then they will not survive because the world is changing so quickly. Accountability is being asked for. Uh, millennials and post-millennials want to know. Yes. You are, um, are you working towards being a sustainable brand? Look, we can't be 100% sustainable, but for young emerging designers, if you plant the seeds of sustainability and grow your business alongside, then you know, your practice keeps growing with your business. But to assume that you don't have to address sustainable practices in your business now is a fallacy because prepare for what's coming up. You will be asked if you are looking after your environment, you will be asked, where is your cotton coming from? You will be asked, are you looking after the the planet while you are creating clothes? And if you're given two t-shirts that look beautiful, the customer is going to choose the t-shirt that is made with sustainable practices as opposed to the one that is not. So young emerging designers have a great potential and an advantage to start thinking about sustainability in their business plan right away. So you start your business with these ideas. Yeah. All right. So, I mean, like, it's all... Sorry, also just to say that... Yes. Bigger is not better. If you Mm -hmm. start making clothes that you think is going to reach out to everyone and bigger is better and I want to have 150 shops and blondly forget yep. that I think now COVID has reminded us that <laughs> you need tight business you need right. a tight business you need an authentic business you yep. almost need tribe who believe in you and have the same sense of ethics that you do um, and by all means I'm not saying you have to um be super expensive, make things yeah. affordable, but they should be valuable. Let you, the, the customers should know why things are expensive because mm. they can show you, the designers can show you because I'm a transparent brand. I'm accountable for that many people. I pay well. And right. emerging designers have a huge advantage to correct a system that was very faulty. Right. Okay. So I mean, like, it's it's. I mean, these. I can tell that these emerging designer has to be serious in their. I mean, like, they're injecting the concept of sustainability in their brand. I mean, like, because it's it's more for not only for making profit, but only make an impact for. I mean, like, for the whole environment. Oh, absolutely. We right. can't have blindfolds on now and say whatever I do. This applies to every industry, but because we are talking about fashion, I think it's very, very important to keep our eyes open and not 
fall into the trap of greenwashing, you mm-hmm. know, which is becoming quite the trend. I mean, you say organic, then you say eco, then you say sustainability, and these all become like vague words. I think we need to take ownership. We need to take personal responsibility as right. a designer, as a consumer. We all need to be actually activist designers, activist consumers. Because only till ah. you start thinking like an activist, do you really uh, take into account why you're buying the things you do and what happens to them when you're done with it. You yeah. know, if you're not an activist, you're not an environmentalist in yeah. your mind, in your heart, in your soul, then you don't care what you buy. You don't care where <laughs> you're throwing things, right? Then you don't right. care which plastic you're using. But if you are an environmental, environmentalist, you are an activist, you're consciously yeah. thinking about the choices that you make. And that's what we want. So if you're saying you have to make decisions consciously, yeah. then you are a mindful person that cares for other people and the environment. So we need to be activists in our own right, right whatever we do. Right, so that pretty much makes sense. And it, it, you know, it giggles me for a bit, I mean like, talking about the fast fashion company that sells sustainable collection, you know, I mean, like any thought about this? I mean, it's because I kind of see this as a little contradiction on the concept. Bandana. <laughs> yeah, they're kind of <laughs> galore, mm-hmm. but I have to give credit to certain fast, fast fashion companies yeah. that are also coming to the table and saying, okay, this much damage has been done. What can yeah. we do now to resolve? Right? Because sustainability world literally i mean at least in my in my life happened the concept came about just in the last five years in my life you know because uh, i don't know it was just just started happening before covid i suppose and now covid everyone is excited to hear about it yeah um so i think Oh my gosh, can we go back to your question? I think I lost my stream of thought. <laughs> I mean, like, um, you know, you know, any thought about the fast fashion company that sells sustainable collection? Because, yeah. you know, it's... <laughs> yeah, that's greenwashing for you. And mm-hmm. a lot of brands do that. Um, mm-hmm. But that's the reason why you have to go into their business practices. Go online, ah. figure out, are they just... Uh, the uh, designers will call it organic, but cotton, organic cotton takes more water than you would imagine right. than any other fabric. So is that sustainable? And if that mm. organic cotton is coming from, let's say, India, where farmlands are getting parched because most of the water has been used for cotton farming and the farmers have to struggle as to, is the water meant for drinking and looking after the family? Is it for cotton farming? So how does that organic cotton become sustainable? We need to be well informed so that we don't get duped into brands that say eco and organic and sustainability and just use them as a little confetti in their collections. And that is that can only happen if we demand better from the brands that we buy because big brands will do anything to make the quickest buck, the fastest way from consumers who are not well informed yeah and they will continue to do it yeah that's pretty much on point so bandana now i would like to flash back a little to your time in vogue india right so i mean like i've read about especially like the folks project renaissance you've done on 2016 right so where you had a journey earlier Oh, earlier than that. Oh, okay. So it's, it means like, you know, you had a journey around the country. I mean, like finding the country's undiscovered treasures. Now, I would like to know, I mean, like, would you mind to share us about that? And what did you discover? I mean, like, what surprised you during the project? What surprised me during the project was I had to yeah. go to several regions of India to have handmade fabrics that how little I knew about my own country. Right. Um, mm-hmm. I also realized how little we understand how much time it takes to make these fabrics. So they're yeah. handmade. The looms are inside the homes of the artisans who live in villages. Yeah. Uh, um, so we have a, a massive artisanal culture in India, for instance. So just going and dipping into 
uh, certain regions and getting these incredible fabrics. And because of my uh, knowledge about uh, the big international brands, looking at a certain fabric and saying, oh, you know, I could send that to Burberry because the color palette is very similar to what they would mm -hmm. use. Or a certain handmade fabric would go to Missoni, for instance, because yes. I knew that this fabric had a certain kind of elasticity as like a weave because right. they do... Uh, it just matched the creative alliance between the particular fabric and the design DNA of uh, these big brands. I would just yeah. bring them together. And so what also surprised me was how excited the international designers were to collaborate and how much, ah. respect, how much respect they had for the beautiful fabrics that were sent to them and to understand the story behind how it's made. So it was a beautiful co-creation between artisans and designers. I was just the conduit putting the two together. Mm -hmm. And the Project Renaissance is very well received. We worked with almost 32 brands. And that had everyone, yeah, had everyone from Gucci to Fendi to Ferragamo, Christian Louboutin, you name it. And of course, several American designers. And um, it was just a joyful a collaboration. It was absolute an exchange of love and cultural camaraderie between the East and the West, you know? Nice. And I wish, I wish there was more and more of this with designers today. Yeah, wow, that is, that is so interesting. I mean, like, you know, 32 brands. I mean, like, can you imagine that? <laughs> right, so um, now I, I would like, I just wonder, I mean, like, do you, do you think, Bandana, there is a possibility for crafters, you know, textile makers to market their stuff without the hand of fashion designer in order to make it sellable. Right. Well, a lot of countries work in like, for instance, in India, yeah. if you go to New Delhi, there are bazaars, okay, and they're called craft villages. Ah, that's okay. That's the card. They're literally craft villages that you can go into, say walking into an open museum, but you can buy <laughs> beautiful crafts that have been certified um, and awarded by the government, for instance. Yep. You can go and indulge. So what's happening is it's direct. It's uh, business to customer, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so you're not going through any platform. But the government needs to be involved. You know, this is about ah. creating a market space Exactly. But now, there are online market spaces where you can dip into handicrafts, which I think yes. is amazing for, uh, for the industry. And of course, we need designers to collaborate, right? So that is always a great way to inspire um, consumers to look into crafts very differently. Because when big designers collaborate with artisans, mm -hmm. suddenly the, the craft becomes really cool, right? Yeah. I mean, Dior just used Balinese Ikat. Trust me, Balinese Ikat is going to be super cool because a big brand used it. So you yeah. have it on that scale, good. That's great PR for the Balinese Ikat. But on the ground, I think we need government policies to support artisanal villages. We need to create market spaces offline and online so there's more engagement. And we need to have great quality control with the artisanal skills because right. for far too long we've been buying crafts like they're just cheap stuff, right? Yep. When did we live in such a dysfunctional world where what is made by hand, what takes months and months to weave, we are actually paying less than a flip-flop from a designer label. Uh. <laughs> Which we are. Yep. If, you compare, if you compare, I bought a beautiful Sumba Ikat yes. once before COVID when I was in Sumba and I promise you what I paid for it is a quarter of what I would have to pay for a designer flip-flop. Oh, wow. Quarter. Quarter. Flip-flop is made out of what? Of course, it's made out of some sort of plastic and branded, looks shiny and lovely, yep. right? Yeah. And on the other hand, I have a Sumba Ika, which is made by hand. I met the women who made it. It would have taken them months to do it. They are hand dyed, hand woven, and I paid a quarter of. Oh price. wow! So we as customers need to really understand what value really is. It's not just in a designer logo, 
it is in the process of making things. The process exactly. is so important. It's not just the product. And the moment you talk about the process, then people become important. So therefore, the weavers become important, right? Yeah. And with COVID, in my very humble opinion, I feel, yes, there's people and the process of making fashion and there's a product, but I think that we need to find a purpose behind it. Just buying right. beautiful things for beauty's sake or having no sense of purpose. Do they, when I buy something, does the community get something in return? You know, right. when you start asking, is that the purpose of my buying? Then I think it's valuable as being a good human being, yep. you know? So we can't just consume for, because we have the money. Where is the money going? Is it giving back to the community? That is very important that take away from me, especially during COVID times. Just don't buy aimlessly. Put your money where you know it's going to benefit, not just the designer has to go all down the value chain and the supply chain. Yeah, got it. So, so I mean, like it's, 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 it's pretty important to, to not only have like an offline market and also the online market as well. I mean, like, especially during these difficult times, right? So regarding to the online environment, Bandana, I mean, like, I can tell that here in Indonesia in the past few years that many, uh, you know, several printed magazines are stopping their printing production and moving to the online media. Do you think that online media could be the future, uh, the future of traditional printed magazine? I don't think we have a choice. I think mm -hmm. the idea that a magazine has to be produced every month and don't forget yes. there are hundreds and hundreds of different titles of magazines. You and did. <laughs> of them have to make a new magazine print a magazine mm -hmm. every month so imagine wow. the volume of production the volume True. of production the volume of the carbon footprint of all the countries that have they have to be sent into and how many bookstores that they have to be sent into so i don't think we have a choice anymore but to be <laughs> very very active and creative online and we see that happening with pretty much all the big top labels, including the magazine I worked with, which is Vogue, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. Like Condé Nast International, as a, brand, as a company, as an umbrella company, uh, yeah. they announced that they would go carbon neutral by 2030, I think. And so even ah. public companies are making big commitments to reduce their carbon footprint, to produce yeah. less. And I think, do we really need that many magazines? And do we really need to buy every month? I think what will happen is we will, there's always the joy of touching and feeling and reading from a magazine that will never go away because it's just pure joy of flipping through. I pages. agree that. <laughs> but I think there'll be lesser number of issues that will be made. Um, so maybe a top magazine will make only two or four beautiful issues that become collector's items as opposed to magazines that we read and we chuck, right? Yeah, right? yeah, so yeah. A lot of resources we are throwing away and we're cutting, yeah. cutting trees for that paper. Exactly. And so I think there'll be less magazines. I think they'll do special issues, which will be made even more beautiful. So you, you keep them like coffee table books. You don't throw away a coffee table book, right? Just yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. dispose of a, a monthly magazine. So I am quite excited for that movement to take place because I do want to hold a magazine in my hand, but I don't need to have a new thing every month. I can go right. online and get beautiful uh, editorials online on a daily basis, right? Got it, yeah. And then once in a while, I get to hold a beautiful magazine in my hand that yep. I can throw away. Yeah, I mean, like that would be interesting because there, because there, is, there are some magazines, you know, like, ID magazine and Fee magazine that they are only have they only have like two seasons a year if I'm not mistaken. I mean like I just wonder what if those various folk from, from various countries did do, do the same thing like that. I mean like that would be lovely. <laughs> yeah, I, I I I'm pretty much optimistic that that's the mm -hmm, way forward mm -hmm. for the publication business. I speak to so many of my friends who are mm -hmm. part of magazines and we seem to be having the common conversation. 
just <laughs> every month is not going to be viable. But going right. online, but just going online doesn't mean you put some nonsense out there because we see a lot of rubbish. Online <laughs> editorials also need to have the standard that you put in a magazine. Yes. Right? Yeah. So I think it works both ways. You need to raise the standard online and wow. then you need to create less of the magazines with yeah. amazing quality, um, not monthly. Not monthly, yeah. We can consider that. I mean, like, there, there might be a lot of homework, but I mean, like, I'm pretty sure that we're, we're getting there, you know. So, still talking about the, still talking around the fashion industry. I mean, as we know, it is, it is a face fast-paced industry as you mentioned before we're not only doing spring summer fall winter i mean like we have couture we have pre evolved resort you name it so i wonder how the industry would adapt to the current situation i mean like even now paris fash paris and milan are doing their spring summer at this time right i mean like what what how how the industry would adapt to the current situation well, I think everyone's realizing that yeah. fashion needs to slow down, right? So it really is. <laughs> it needs to slow down for all the yeah. right reasons. What yeah. I mean by that is think about the slow food movement, right? Suddenly everyone was so concerned about what they're putting in, ingesting into their bodies. So exactly. slow food, organic food became a huge yeah. thing. We, we live yeah. in Bali, we are so aware of everything that comes with the food industry, veganism, this, I mean, it's like everyone wants to be healthy. Now it's time to think about not what's going inside our body, but what we are covering our bodies with and slowing down the process. And, you know, couture is very good at that because couture is always about unique pieces. They're mostly made by hand. Yes. It takes a long time to make it. It's made to measure. <clears throat> so that means it's, it's customized it's about a relationship between designer and customer. Yeah. Um, fast fashion needs to slow down, there's no doubt. So we need a slow fashion movement to take place where we appreciate what it takes to make, create slowly. And when you create slowly, you're creating mindfully, you're creating, keeping people and planet in mind. And I think that's an urgent need for the fashion industry to slow down. And that's why going back to made by hand is almost like yeah. an ideological shift. Because as we know, if you go and sit with the weavers, it's like an act of meditation. You need a lot ah. of patience and slowness of thought and action to be able to yeah. weave again and again, right? Um, so I, I feel that it is imperative that we slow down the fashion, yeah. the, the fashion machine that just with regurgitating and creating and throwing so much out there we really don't need that much. <laughs> All right. So, I mean, like, as you, as you say that the fashion has, has to get slowed down and, and in terms of like, couture is like, like pretty much meditative. I mean, like for me, I mean, like it's when we see like Iris van Herpen, I mean, like, you know, those beautiful pieces. I mean, like, do you think there is, there is a room for the, the, these amazing couture designer to, you know, to, raise their name up during, during this COVID period, you know? Yeah, I think absolutely yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if, I mean, couture, so let's be realistic about it. It can yeah. only be afforded by that 1% that we talk about. Exactly. <laughs> Not the 99.9 .9 like me. Yeah. <laughs> so, but what I do appreciate and as a yeah. person who loves creativity, I can appreciate it without having to own it. Right, so yeah, yeah. beautiful a couture Dior gown is beautiful, no doubt. And it's taken hours and hours and hours into making of it. Um, at a time like this, I just think about the people who have the kind of money to buy couture. Yeah, if you are going to spend your money wisely, you're probably going to buy something of great value that you're going right. to put in your cupboard and keep it as an heirloom that you'll pass on to your daughter or your son. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it plays a big role because you don't throw a couture dress into a bin. You pass it down. Just oh. in the same way, no one throws a sari in India. You know, the seven yards right. of a handmade fabric. Oh my you don't gosh. Have the of throwing away. You throw away, it's almost like an unsacred act. You have to pass it down. Yeah. 
So Couture should be doing much better because it has the ethos of longevity, of handmade, of slow fashion. And so, yeah, I think this is a great time to have a couture mind, state of mind. There but you even go. Designers, even designers who are not doing couture can mm -hmm. have the couture state of mind, which is creating a smaller collection, creating mindfully, creating as a... Um, with a beautiful customer uh, experience because it's made to order so you don't have to throw away extra inventory so right. you need to have a couture state of mind couture state that is a that is a really good word to hear but okay i guess we're going to have one last question and i would like to give an uh, i would like to give a talk about you know you know like um diversity and inclusivity in fashion has been rising throughout the year as we started to see more representation in fashion magazine like Halima, the first hijabi who creates a folk cover. You know what I mean? Like what, in your personal opinion, how important a representation in fashion is as you work for, for, Indi for India, you know? Yeah, well, this is one of the best things that happened during my tenure in fashion. Right. We'd be able to see that what was happening on the streets as socio-political, protests, movements that were happening on the streets, whether it is LGBTQ rights, whether yes. it is uh, gender rights and feminist agenda and what have you. We saw people wearing their ideals and ideology on their sleeves, literally, right? Exactly. Slogans you were wearing, the kind of clothes, gender fluidity came very yes. much because of LGBTQ rights going on the streets and protesting. And you can see, wow, who's catering to the gender fluid community. Mm -hmm. Someone who doesn't want to, uh, we know what gender fluidity is, who doesn't want to fall into the brackets of male and female. And suddenly designers woke up to the diversity that had been ignored. It right. was always about women looking pretty and men looking handsome. <laughs> you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And that was a continuum from forever, from whenever fashion started. Yep. And then this big change because of all the protests on the streets. And I love seeing covers now where you have, if you say we're celebrating LGBTQ rights, then you have a real gay person on the cover, not a right. big dude who's just done up gay and, and makeup and clothes. Right. You have a, a responsibility to represent in an authentic way, right? Not just saying, oh, it's gender fluidity. I'll put a heterosexual man in a skirt, <laughs> which has been done in the past. That's I've not seen authentic. It. That's not authentic. If you want to talk about trans fashion, put the trans person on the cover then. A hundred percent. I hundred percent agree. And come on, look trans because there are authentic trans, incredible men and women who have yeah. the right to be uh, represented in an authentic way. Right. And I mean, like, we cannot forget, I mean, like, there are quite, like, a, quite a lot, like, trans models who are also beautiful. I mean, like, look at Dara, you know, I mean, like, she's amazing. Going back to the idea of beauty. Whose idea of beauty am I subscribing to? Because beauty comes right. in so many forms. So that was another big change that happened, right? That right. first it was only about black and white. Like, you know, mm -hmm. you were beautiful if you were white and then if you had shades of brown and black, then you fell down <laughs> the ladder of beauty. That has changed completely. And that comes uh -huh. again with uh, Black Lives Matter because we are so now in tune and exposed to a culture that has been uh, neglected, marginalized, right? And then exactly. when you talk about Black Lives Matter, then you think about where's the Asian representation in big yeah. fashion? And that yeah. came... So I think the idea of beauty changed just, as, and that's what diversity is about. Fashion started responding to not just having stereotypical beauties on the covers or inside the magazine. They started representing regions. And, and that was so important to see because we do want our children to grow up and look at a billboard and look at a magazine and say, hey, yeah. there's someone who looks like me, my skin color, my type. Oh. You know, I think that is what encourages women and men to own their individuality, own their cultural provenance and be proud of human beings instead of thinking that you don't fit into 
the standard of beauty that's been defined again and again. 100%. By the yeah. of, uh, industries. <laughs> oh, wow. Vandana. I mean, like, there's, there are a lot of, I mean, like, insightful comments I've, I've got from you. I mean, like, really enjoyed the conversation for the last, I don't know, I lost count, maybe like 60 minutes already. <laughs> It was so lovely. I mean, like, thank you. I mean, like, thank you so much for participating in Kembali 2020. I mean, like, we we love having you here. I I'm so grateful to Kembali. I'm I feel excited when I have to do something when I'm in Indonesia, <laughs> and uh, I do miss the offline events. You know, we uh, all do. <laughs> and, you know, to be hug and share thoughts one on one and in a group. But this is an amazing opportunity. And for that, I'm really, really thankful and grateful. Right. So all the best for your future endeavor. And, you know, hopefully to, hopefully to catch up soon, non-virtually, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I'll come down to Ubud and we'll go grab a coffee together. Yes, for sure. All right. Thank you. Again, thank you. Appreciate your time, Bandana. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so that's all my session with Bandana Tewari, uh, the future of fashion in Kembali 2020. So Kembali 20 was made possible with the support of the Yayasan Mudraswari Saraswati Patron Program and their donors. The Patron Program was created to seek assistance for the survival both of festival and the foundation by making value, valuable contribution to the Yayasan Patron Program. You will be directly involved in delivering both festivals in due time. Your contribution will guarantee the future of Indonesia's most meaningful cross-cultural platform of words, ideas, culture, and the creative arts. Follow at Ubud Writers Festival on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, or visit ubudwritersfestival.com for more information about the patron, patron program. So, Rivo Saulus and Bandana Tewari signing off. Thank you. Thank you.